report 18 months ago gave us all an opportunity to share its deliberations and conclusions and very thoughtful and thought, especially at this time in the history of higher education. Dazzling technologies, seismic shifts in higher education in a fast changing world. And over the next few days, we hope to learn from colleagues all over the world who are harnessing technology, not only technology, but the astonishing power of the web to improve higher education and indeed extend its reach. So where better to gather than in Hyderabad, a city not only ancient in its establishment, but also modern, a city with a rich intellectual life and a higher education presence, but also a city known, I am told, as Cyberabad, for the presence of many local and international technology companies. We are grateful to two local universities for their offer to host us, and we thank them for the hospitality that we are experiencing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a rich palette of speakers, and I will delay you no longer in my welcoming remarks. Allow me simply, on behalf of the Council and the members of the ACU, to thank you for being here despite the difficulties that many of you have experienced and the tragic circumstances that are being played out in Mumbai. I bid you again most warmly welcome. Thank you for your attention. The first of these is Professor A. M. Paton. Professor Paton is Vice Chancellor of Milana Razad National Urdu University. He is a distinguished geologist with many prestigious national committee and panel memberships on his CV and has spent many years as a vice chancellor not only at this but other universities. Professor Paton. Good morning to all distinguished colleagues and you are being in Hyderabad Sabko Adab, Chair of the this morning's session and Vice Chancellor of Open University, Professor Brinda Gorle, Chairman University Grants Commission, Professor Sukhdev Thorat, Professor John Tarrant, Secretary General of ACU. My distinguished <coughs> colleague and co-host, Professor Hasnain, Vice Chancellor from Central University, Hyderabad, Dr. Ilov, Dorothy, distinguished Vice Chancellors for, from the Commonwealth countries, invitees, members of the academic fraternity, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a rare honor to be present amongst you all today at this inaugural session of ACU Conference of Executive Heads and to welcome you all as co-host to Hyderabad, a historic city of over 400 years, a city of historic monuments and pearls, a city of delectable cuisine and fine culture, a city that straddles modernity and tradition with a unique elan and poise. Now I would just like to take a few moments of you to introduce your co-host institution, that is my university, Maulana Azad National Urdu University, which was established in 1998 by an act of Indian Parliament as a central university with all India jurisdiction and the mandate to promote and develop Urdu language, a language that has played a significant role in shaping India's and this city's culture and history. 
It is empowered to offer education through both distance as well as campus mode of education and has managed to reach out to over 150,000 students in this short span of its existence. We have seven schools, 12 departments, two directorates. MANU is a special purpose institution that is trying to link and bridge the seismic shifts that have led to the co-engagement of Urdu speakers in education. It will be a please, it will be pleased to meet with you all on 30th evening and also to take you around the university campus. But I'm afraid because of yesterday's sad incidents, unfortunate incidents, this we may have to rethink. I'm happy that ACU has identified an extremely pertinent topics for its scholarly deliberation, and it is proof of the fact that all universities have seriously reflect on their roles as social institutions that need greater and more enduring links with the social milieu, technology, with its process and application in education, present a sharp challenge to university to this context, in this context. The challenge that we are able to perform, not as exclusive islands of knowledge and information, but as institutions that strive to bring about and maintain a harmonious and balanced process of change with equity. I welcome you once again to this city of pearls and excellent cuisine and to the conference and trust that you, your stay will not only be academically satisfying but also pleasant and memorable. Welcome you once again and thank you very much for patient hearing. Last Chancellor, Professor Sayed Hasnain. Professor Hasnain is also a person with a distinguished academic background in the life sciences, which in the way the recipient of many honours and a number of very important uh, committee memberships. But he comes to us today as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Hyderabad. Professor Tarrant, Professor Patan, Professor Ilof, distinguished vice chancellors, educationists, delegates, and friends. Welcome to India. Welcome to Hyderabad. And welcome to this ACU meeting. Due to the unfortunate incidents that happened in the last 48 hours, we could not have our Honorable Union Minister of Science and Education. He had to cancel out his visit because of the developments in Mumbai. He would have been an excellent person to inaugurate this conference, given his background as a Minister of Science and Technology and the theme of this conference. We are particularly pleased that this conference is being hosted in Hyderabad, which has, over the years, emerged as the knowledge hub of the country. There is no other city in the country that can boast of not only the tradition, but at the same time, the modern values that we are all trying to inculcate. Truly, Hyderabad is a knowledge hub with more than 40 federal institutions, with three federal universities. Two of us are hosting it. The Vice Chancellor of the Third University is here with us, Professor Abhay Maurya, and many other top-ranking universities as well as research institutions. This city also boasts of being the pharma capital of the country. More than 50% of the drugs 
made in the country are from this state of Andhra Pradesh, bulk of which are produced right here in Hyderabad. We are also the biotech capital of the country. Several biotech industries, companies, institutions are functioning from within the, within the city of Hyderabad. The world's second largest production facility for recombinant product is right here in Hyderabad. So much so that Hyderabad is, is getting to be known as the vaccine capital of the country. The largest producer of recombinant vaccines are here in Hyderabad. Given this background, it was quite logical for me to assume that the ACU would like to have this meeting here in Hyderabad. There is truly a seismic shift and the impact of science and technology in higher education just cannot be ignored. And I'm particularly pleased to associate the University of Hyderabad with this meeting. And on behalf of the University of Hyderabad, I would like to thank the, the ACU for, a, for asking us to be the co-host for this meeting. The University of Hyderabad was created about 34 years ago by an act of federal legislation. And in the last 34 years, we have really covered a long distance, though we believe we have a much more longer distance to go. There are several USPs or unique selling points about the University of Hyderabad. Perhaps the only university in the country where the teaching teacher-student ratio is just one is to nine. For every faculty member, we just have about nine students. And the net result of which is highest degree of competition to get entry into the University of Hyderabad and huge demand for our alumni, both in India and abroad, many of which are holding important positions in India and abroad. Our university also has a large horiz spread horizontally as, as well as vertically. And this large spread allows us to be a truly innovator, not only to create knowledge, but also to disseminate knowledge to a much wider audience. With 10 schools encompassing sciences, <coughs> humanities, social sciences, medical sciences, engineering and technology, and the performing arts, the dance, drama, theater, and also the management, we are perhaps truly a bit more like a liberal art education system. Every student who joins the University of Hyderabad gets a fellowship. And not only does he get a fellowship if he does the best, if he's the best in the class, the fellowship gets to be doubled. I can talk more and more about the university, but I would like to just focus on higher education scenario in the country today. And I'm sure the chairman of the University Grants Commission is here. I would just like to say a few words. Higher education in India is truly at a crossroad right now. There is a realization that we must increase our gross enrollment ratio which is abysmally poor today, and that will need heavy investment. Fortunately, the government of India is already committed to make this heavy investment, and has already made ambitious plans, plans to start 30 new federal universities, plans to start eight new IITs, new IIMs, 20 new national institutes of technology. And of course, at the state level, about 400 new colleges to ensure that every single district in the Union of India gets at least one college. All this will naturally 
pose humongous problems for higher education when it comes to what we are looking at in India. And in this context, I feel it's a great thing to have the ACU deliberations here, to learn what's happening in the other parts of the world, particularly in the Commonwealth countries, and then to strategize our own initiatives. Let me conclude by formally welcoming you and also thanking the ACU for hosting this meeting here. A very warm welcome, Khush Hamdeed, to Hyderabad. Thank you very much, Professor Snain. Now, many of you will be already familiar with uh, Professor John Tarrant, the Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, Vice Chancellor of the University of Huddersfield for many years, and a long standing member of the uh, ACU, one of its staunch supporters through the years before he retired from. For their extremely generous and warm welcome to all of us uh, to this city. Uh, and to India, and to welcome all of you to this very important conference uh, of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. The ACU has two important groups of functions it performs on behalf of its member universities across the Commonwealth. Small adjustment to the change of height here. Thank you. The first of these groups of functions is to facilitate networking, sharing best practice, benchmarking ourselves against performance of others, uh, and to learn from each other about all the important aspects of our university work, our teaching and learning, our research, our university management, and our work with our communities. This conference is one example, one example of many, of how we do this. There can be no doubt that technology is changing and has already changed every single aspect of our work in universities across the Commonwealth. It is sometimes called a disruptive technology because it not only facilitates change, but it forces us to change. It forces us in a particular way in, in the university sector because our students are coming better informed about the technology than we are. And we have to run to keep up. The second major group of functions for the ACU is advocacy on behalf of the importance of higher education. And that will be the theme of our next annual conference. There is now fortunately a very widespread understanding of how higher education is of fundamental importance to all of our societies and to all of our economies. And the the upcoming changes in the Indian higher education, which Professor Thorite will talk about in a moment, is one very clear illustration of that recognition. And the importance of higher education must be reflected, as it is being reflected in India, in government policy towards higher education. And next year, for the first time, at the meeting of Commonwealth Ministers of Education, which is being held in Kuala Lumpur in June 2009. For the first time, this ministerial meeting will have a Vice-Chancellor's Forum as a part of its uh, meeting. We will make that forum our annual meeting and we will use that opportunity to allow our members to interact with ministers of education across the Commonwealth to interact with them formally and informally in order to stress and re-stress the importance of our work 
to the economies and societies of countries throughout the Commonwealth. I would like to conclude by expressing all of our sympathies to those people who have been so tragically affected by the <coughs> events in Mumbai, the ongoing events in Mumbai. You will realize that this has forced us to make a number of last minute changes to the program, and I apologize for that, and it will be somewhat uncertain uh, as we progress through the next few days. But we all felt it was very important to continue uh, in as normal a frame as possible. So I hope you will enjoy this conference, I hope you will find it valuable, and I hope also that you will enjoy this, albeit rather brief, visit to this wonderful country of India. Thank you very much. The next item on your program is a message from Mr. Kamala Sharma, who, as you know, is the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. He can't be physically present, but he's been kind enough to record a message to us, and this is a message which we shall now play. I hope. So do I. <laughs>
an essential solution in an unequal Commonwealth which contains some 25 million children of primary school age who do not go to school, how can technology and innovation help us uh, in our poorest and most challenged education systems to deliver more and better education at all levels? That is the question and I wish you well in your discussions. Please accept my sincerest apology for the inconvenience caused, he says. Please oblige me by conveying my warm greetings to the delegates and best wishes for the success of the conference. We too uh, wish that see on the program that we had uh, three speakers for this session. Um, Lord Putnam of Queensgate uh, was going to speak to us and the Honourable Minister uh, Sri Kapil Sebal. Lord Putnam is stuck in uh, Bangkok. The airports are closed. Um, I'm not too sorry for him. He's in the Oriental Hotel, I think. And he has uh, made it possible for his speech to be available and I will deliver it at, at a later session. Um, the, the minister, as you can well understand, has been called to D2, sends his apologies. So we are even more grateful than we normally would be, Professor Thorat, <laughs> that you have uh, possible to be here with us today. We thank you for that very much. It's a great um, pleasure for me to introduce you. Uh, having established himself on both national and international civility, institution and economic growth, human rights issues and education, to name but some. He has a vast number of publications to his name and an astonishing number of diverse projects to his credit. His work has attracted honours from various quarters, including honorary doctorates from several universities. We are honoured to have him address us today, Professor Thorat. Professor Benda Gole, the Chair of the ACU, uh, Professor John Tarrant, the Secretary General of the ACU, uh, Professor A.M. Pathan, Vice Chancellor of Moulana Azad National Urdu University, Professor Syed Hasnan, uh, the Vice Chancellor of University of Hyderabad, uh, Dr. Inouf, uh, the Vice Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor of the various universities from the Commonwealth countries and from India, the other participants, the student and the person from India, ladies and gentlemen. Well, before I began, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, let me begin by, on your behalf, uh, to send our emotions and our feeling to those who have uh, lost uh, their lives uh, in the city of Bombay. Uh, the Honorable Minister obviously could not come because of that reason. I was literally on the words of getting dropout, but uh, somehow managed to come. But I am I'm, I'm very delighted and I am very happy to be here uh, for this very important conference of uh, Association of Commonwealth University cities. Uh, University Grand Commission is, is really happy to the association for hosting this conference in India, recognizing the importance of India. Uh, the city of Hyderabad uh, is selected and I am very happy that two of our prominent universities, uh, the Maulana Azad Urdu University and Central University of Hyderabad are the co-host of th this conference. I need not mention the importance of the association. This is one of the oldest and largest inter-university associations in the world with uh, as many as 37 countries and I understand as many as 500 members. 
Professor Terent has rightly pointed out the objectives and the goal of this association. And he has mentioned it in a very nice word, twofold goal of association. That is to share the experiences, the best practices of the Commonwealth countries in the higher education with each other and learn from the best practices uh, in that sphere of higher education. But more importantly, with a focus on higher education. And this conference is an attempt uh, to, that, to that sharing of higher education experiences in one of the areas of uh, one, of, one of the very important sphere. Friends, the central theme of this conference, as you know, is focus and center around the role of information technology, the new, new channel and new instrument that we got in the promotion of higher education, in the, in the use of higher education. And this is something which is indeed marvelous that it has completely changed the way we look at the education. It needs changes on the part of the university in the methods, the way we teach, the way, way we undertake research, the way we share information through libraries, the way we train our teachers. And therefore, this is an extremely important issue which needs to be discussed. From the list of the topic and the paper, one gets so excited that there are innumerable number of opportunities through this technology to expand the frontier of higher education. I had an opportunity to go through some of the titles. The Classroom Without Walls in Global Village, Overcoming Tyrannies of Geography, paper from Africa, Virtual Learning, e-learning, issue related to open and distance education, teacher education, cross-border education, cross-cultural perspective on higher education. You can see that uh, there are a number of issues in higher education which this conference is going to address. Well, there are two points I would like to mention before you, before I proceed further and share with you the Indian experience and then extend it to the to our common experience in the Commonwealth countries. I think there are two points during my course of tenure as a chairman of the UGC that I came across. One, that the Commonwealth countries have a common past. And as a result, the higher education system in this country has also a common past, which has spilled over into present. And there is a huge similarity in our higher education system because of that, that common past. I presume, like India, that many of the universities in the Commonwealth country in the beginning were set up under the British Education Act. Four of our early universities, three of our early universities, Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta, were set up directly under the British Education Act. It is only the Central University of Hyderabad. Now it's a Central University which was set up under Indian Act. And I'm quite sure that in many Commonwealth countries that is the pattern. It is that common past which is going under transformation that really binds us together and that provides opportunity to share our experiences from that common past. Second point that I encounter in the course of my working in the University Grant Commission and developing, looking at the higher education, is that the Commonwealth community is a diversified community. It is not an homogeneous community with in respect to their higher education. You have countries which are developed in higher education and change drastically over a period of time. You have a different system in UK now, you have a different system in Australia, New Zealand, probably other countries. So you have the countries which have learned from the experiences and have developed a system based on experience. You are countries which are still learning and trying to change their higher education system. Therefore, this heterogeneity 
of experience in higher education also provides an abundant opportunity for the universities in this country to learn from each other. Let me give you a very small example and you will understand. The University Grant Commission that I chair, original name was University Grant Committee, because in London, the name of the higher education institution was University Grant Committee. That name got changed into commission, we got also changed into commission. There is some drastic change there. We are thinking of higher education commission and several other things. The point is, the things do not remain static. Things change, there are new challenges, and so organizations need to be changed. And so if there is a change in UK and Australia, that comes as an experience for us, for India and many other Commonwealth countries, because in the beginning, the institution were built up on a same pattern. So the second important characteristic, in my view, which you, you would, I urge you to remember in the course of your discussion is that while we begin with a similarity of uh, situation and experiences, we have gone in a diverse direction. Some are more advanced, some are less advanced, some are struggling with their own situations. And the diversity became more imminent and evidence because of our differences in social, political, economic system. So there is a great opportunity for us to learn from each other as to how others have handled the issues because they had gone ahead, far ahead. Can we learn from them? Can we, if not imitate the things as it is, but can we adjust and apply to our situation, taking into our situation specificities and conditions. I think these two important points are very important. Our common past and our, our present, which binds us together with the diversified experiences. And I'm quite sure that the developing countries and even India, as I will share with you later, that we are struggling, we are making effort to develop the higher education system, meet the demand of higher education system, Therefore, this mutual experience, in my view, uh, uh, will help uh, all of us to learn from each other and gain from each other. And that is one of the goals, as has been pointed out, to learn from the best practices. Well, let me pose certain issues before you. And I, the best way to pose bef issue before you is to take the Indian experience and then possibly extend it to the other countries and then see what we can do with respect to the theme that we have in this conference. As far as the Indian higher education system is concerned, Professor Asnan and others have made a reference that uh, 11th fire plan, which began in 2008, uh, really make a different beginning for higher education. But since independence in 1950, higher education system in India came a long way. Uh, in terms of institutional capacity, it has grown uh, manifold. We begin with 25 universities in 1950. We, we have uh, today about 410 or 420 universities, central, state, private. We begin with only 700 colleges, and we have more than 25 colleges now of the different types. We begin with a couple of thousand of teachers in the university. We have about 500,000 faculty members in the colleges and the university. We begin with a couple of lakhs of students, a couple of thousands of students in the early 50s. We have about, if we include distance education, we should we include a 15 million to 16 million students going into the higher education system. So many, many fold increase in the higher education. And as a result of that expansion of institutional capacity, which provide access to large number of the students who complete their higher secondary, the access has increased. The educational scientists measure the access, as you are quite familiar with a, what is called enrollment ratio, that you take the student youth in the age group of 18 to 23 or 24 and see the percentage of what fraction of that goes to the higher education. Friends, it was less than 1% in 1950. It is now close to 13%, 14% if we take certificate and diplomas. But if we take degree alone, then it is 11%. A 11 point fold increase in the access to higher education in terms of gross enrollment ratio. 
But notwithstanding this rapid growth in higher education, we are faced with the problem. And I'm quite sure the other countries, in, uh, Commonwealth countries coming from Africa and other part have a similar problem. And I would like to po share those problems within five minutes so that then I would like to urge upon you as to how the information technology that, uh, will help us to realize those goals. We recognize four problems in higher education after a very careful study of review of the earlier past. First is that our, despite our increase in the access to higher education to the tune of 11 to 13 percent, yet this is low compared to the world average of 23 percent or 37 to 35 percent for uh, country in the middle income group or more than 55, 60, 70, 80 percent for the developed country like UK and Australia and others. So 12 percent visa is 23 percent or 55 percent is a low access. <clears throat> but beside comparison, I being an economist, I know that even for a minimum economic growth, for a takeoff economic growth, you require certain human resource. And on the basis of the past experience, some of the education scientists have worked out that for any country to be on a path of sustained economic development require at least 20 to 25 percent of their youth after higher secondary to go for higher education. Then you will be able to meet the minimum requirement of human resources. So we recognize that we need to expand the access. But we also recognize two more problems, and which I believe are also the problem for the Africans and other countries, namely that 11 to 12 percent or 13 percent, 11 based on degree, 13, 14 percent based on certificate and diploma combining, is that the All India story, at the state level and the regional level, we have a lot of disparities. Some state, states have a much higher access ratio, some regions have a much higher access to higher education, others have much less, and disparities are immense. It may vary from 6 percent of GDR uh, the gross enrollment ratio and it goes up to 23% uh, or 20%, state like Kerala. Second issue, that beside this interregional disparity, we have inter-social group disparities. That the average may be 11%, but there are group in society, social group, economic group, occupational group, gender, girls, those disparities exist. As against the annual average ratio of 11 percent, you have groups with enrollment ratio of 6 percent, 5 percent, 7 percent, 8 percent. And therefore, we recognize that intersocial group disparities between social group, between gender, between religion, between poor and non-poor, they need to be addressed. And I think the information technology has an important role to play. I'll come to that later. So the object, second objective was to have an inclusive education, the education which will provide an equal opportunity to those who lags behind. And remember well that if you want to increase the enrollment ratio or access to higher education, it is the access of those who have less access and will have to be increased, not of those who already have a higher access. So you have to focus on regions, you have to focus on group which have less access. But we also recognize that Expansion with inclusiveness and equal opportunity will have to be combined with the expansion with quality. The third issue that we recognize that any expansion in higher education will have to come through a quality education and excellence and promotion of creative net and innovativeness among the students and the youth. I would not like to go. You have a long lecture. I am not going to repeat that lecture, but you can read it if you are interested on the quality issue from that. Uh, handouts. Quality issues are equally important. And we recognize that. We have a National Assessment and Accreditation Council set in Bangalore, which assess the universities and the colleges and rank them according to their grade. They have covered a substantial number of universities and you grade their grading. And we discovered there are inter-institutional variations in quality and that there are factors for those in terms of infrastructure, in terms of human resources, in terms of faculty. We recognize that. And therefore, we have a plan in the 11th plan for several measures for improvement of quality. And last point that we recognized was that expansion with, will come with inclusiveness. We will have to come with inclusiveness and quality, but also the relevant education. 
We love to provide the education which is relevant. People might disagree what constitutes relevant education, but we do need to recognize relevance education. I personally feel relevant education involves giving to the student everything that exists in the subject so that he is exhausted and then he starts raising questions that the existing knowledge doesn't give me the answer to the question that I want. He became creative, he became innovative. But people also argue that besides knowledge, we require to give them the skills to increase their employability. People also ask that in addition to skill and knowledge, we must give them values. And in this modern world, giving them values through education is equally important. Value of democracy, value of secularism, value of non-discrimination, value of brotherhood, value of fraternity, so that what we see around today will not happen again. So you should give a thought to it. I think there is a very important topic here, cross-cultural perspective uh, through the instrument of information technology. So I think we recognize the expansion will have to come through inclusiveness, quality, and relevance. And information technology and other instruments are the instrument and mechanism of realizing these four goals. Friends, I do believe that the next conference is on higher education uh, that will provide an opportunity to understand the educational system of all these countries. And I have a feeling that the four or five issues that I have shared with you are the issues which are faced similarly in many of the African countries, many of the less developed countries or developing countries. And we have tried to address those issues. I don't want to go into that. The government has taken an extremely bold initiative to increase the allocation to higher education by almost nine to ten fold. And this expansion has to come by creating new universities, to which Hasnan has made a reference, 30 new universities, seven to seven IIM, in the Institute of Management, IITs, Polytechnics. We develop a policy for regional imbalances, addressing the issue of regional imbalances. 373 districts have been identified with a lower access ratio, and additional institutions will be created there. We develop a policy on which, uh, under which we will focus on the relatively neglected group so that their access to higher education is developed. But there are problems of this group, and I would, I would like to come in the last presentation of my presentation that how information technology should address this issue. Because if you want to teach and bring more uh, relatively backward students into the higher education system, they have their specific problem which need to be addressed. And there are several schemes. We have addressed several issues of quality. Assessment of university and colleges is, is not mandatory today in India. Out of 410 universities, only 140 have been assessed. Out of 20,000 colleges, only 3,250 colleges have been assessed. Bulk of them are outside the uh, assessment of NAC. We are trying to make it mandatory now, and we have taken one of the most bold steps, that is to set up a quality assessment cell in each of the university so that they assess their performance on an annual basis, and that became a self-assessment mechanism that will be introduced as a part of the 11th plan from this year. But there are a number of other quality uh, related issue. I hope these are the issues which are for the other countries as well. The scarcity of a good faculty, uh, good teacher, regional accessibility, teacher not going to the remote area. These are the issues which are very important we, which we, t we have tried to address uh, in the 11th plan. I would not like to share with you, but I believe that these are the issues which are faced by many other countries. Well, coming to the role of this conference, use of information technology, new instrument that has been given by science to us, I think it is, it is indeed a It is indeed a gift. That it not only helped the educational stream of distance mode and open learning in a tremendous way, but also help the traditional university, the classroom teaching, in a much more uh, wider way. This is a mode which 
which uh, this technology enable us to remove the boundaries of space, remove the boundaries of distance, reduce the distance between student and the taught, reduce the distance between the availability of the literature through, through the e-governance and e-journal, getting the journal and the book at the tip of your finger in the library is something which was never imagined 10, 15 years before. We run that scheme, I'll share with you. I think this, this uh, instrument, information technology, has a, has a powerful role to change our higher education system and to meet these four goals. We'll be able to expand higher education at a much faster speed through this technology. We'll be able to reach out to, to those regions where it is higher education is less possible through this technology. Interregional disparities will be addressed. It will be able to reach out to the, those poor who cannot be a form of the formal system through this instrument. It has a tremendous role to change your values, yeah? your approach, your norms, towards a good principle of life. It has a tremendous uh, use. We in India, of course, have tried to use it. We have a strong open learning system, two central universities, Indira Gandhi National Open University, Manu, 13 state universities, and of course, open school. But beside that, in each of the 410 universities, each of the 20,000 colleges, open learning system is a department, is a part. So open learning through this technology has been embedded into the formal system. In fact, Indira Gandhi University has taken an initiative of bringing them together, the formal and the open. And I think one of the best examples is the, the institute in UK. I, I had an opportunity to go and see that institute of lifelong learning, 150 year old, which has combined the formal system with uh, uh, open learning with the formal system. We did uh, introduce this with, a, with this network of the institutions. But I think there are a number of other initiatives. University Grant Commission has set up what is called Consortium for Communication Education, which has 17 centers in the country. They, these have been expanded. And it is through this technology, the lecturing, e-journals, uh, e-content, and other mechanism, the education is being imparted and transferred and given to the students. We have what is called Infonet, very long form. E-journalist scheme is provided. Number of universities get these journals through the initiative of the UGC to the student free of cost. They can download the papers, science, which are more expensive paper, but download the paper free of cost. We are introducing e-book, a standard e-book put on the, uh, the uh, internet and student can uh, download and make use of it. You know better than I do what a potential this technology has in terms of providing the material at a much, much cheaper cost. <coughs> Huge amount of money we spend on journals. College cannot afford, university cannot afford. But this technology has provided us an opportunity whereby it is so cost effective. Well, these are, I, I need not, you, you, you are the people in the expert areas, you know better than I do, but I think uh, uh, this is a very important topic that you have selected and that uh, and, and the best mind here, you are the head of the institution, you are the practitioner, you are the one who give the leadership. Uh, I interact with them quite, quite a lot. And I think I, you will apply your mind as to how we use this technology uh, for realization of those four goals, I think. If there are more goals, that is most welcome. But I think these are the four goals we, I, in our view, are important for India and definitely for the other countries as such. Well. I will make a last point and stop. Uh, I, I spent 30 to 35 years in academics, and I joined for the first time uh, the position which is also academic administration position. And I realized one thing, that as an academic, to analyze and make a suggestion is an easy thing, relatively easy thing. That is equally important. But to translate that point and suggestion into a policy and into a workable program, into a scheme which will deliver good, is much equally difficult things. And therefore, I'll urge for you 
that the conferences should not be confined to the discussion and summaries. We will benefit and you will benefit provided the discussion and the deliberation and the application of the best mind in the business of higher education come with the best practices, codify them and circulate to us so that we can try and we can put into practice. It is, it is not always possible to imit, imitate the best practices because the cultural, social and other situations vary, but we can adopt. Technology is adopted, technology is never imitated because you have to adopt the technology to your own local situation. It has to be situation specific and condition specific. Please develop a document based on your deliberation here that what is best for the developing countries like ours and others, uh, what can be learned from the experiences of some of the developed countries in terms of higher education, so that those modules, those best practices can be translated into practice through the policy. And I look forward to that kind of a document. I look forward to that kind of, that kind of recommendation, uh, Madam Really, The last point, and then I'll end, is that we are living in a globalized world. We may like or not. It is liberty, it is freedom for the student to take admission anywhere in the world. We cannot stop that. We can put obstacle, but we cannot, we cannot stop it. And then there are issues that we face. Recognition of degrees, sharing of curriculum, sharing of teaching. Huge number of issues have now appeared on the scene as a result of these cross-border interactions and, uh, and globalization of the higher education. And I know the amount of number of people and countries are coming to India and we are going to the other countries and des uh, discussing various issues. And that is a good thing. Commonwealth Conference is a part of that. I look not that economics is not important. But I think education involves creating citizens, creating human beings. And what will help us is to share our experiences on a mutual basis, on the basis of partnership, on understanding of each other's, and not by the principle of competitions. There is a competition, but a competition of a kind. and not on the, definitely not on the principle of commerce. I think if we can keep this in mind, we'll be able to come a little more closer, we will, we will, uh, we'll be able to help each other through this mutual cooperation, partnership, and concern. Well, I would like to end my small intervention. Uh, I, again, uh, indeed, <coughs> grateful to the Association for inviting me here. This is my first participation. I'm also grateful to the Vice Chancellor, Hyderabad and Manu, Dr. Pathan and Dr. Hasnan for inviting me here. And uh, I welcome you all on behalf of University Grant Commission because we will be the beneficiary, uh, many of our Vice Chancellor and we in UGC will be beneficiary of your deliberation. I, I really welcome you here. And as has been pointed out, this is a wonderful city, uh, world city, center of all educational institutions. Uh, they know how to treat you and welcome you and feed you with the best quality food. And uh, with this welcome and best wishes, I end my presentation. Thank you. Because you cannot expect a child, a learner, to be in a school where, the, where there's no technology, where the technology is indeed still the blackboard or the green board. And then all of a sudden at the university level or at the college level, you're confronted with very modern technologies. And then finally, I realized how big this task is and that we in the higher education system cannot do this alone. And that unless our different governments, and indeed the Commonwealth, assist us to create an environment in which this is possible, it will always be running against the wind or swimming against the stream. The role of governments and state aid, aid in this regard are indeed very important. Finally, Professor Torat, I, I thought that you made a very important last comment. And that is that if we see this 
environment that we live and work in only as a competition, we basically doomed to fail. Yes, there are competitive elements. We are often competing for good students, for good lecturers, etc., etc. But for the overall cause, unless we have the partnerships across state boundaries, across country boundaries, across the southern and northern hemisphere, the east and the west, we will fail in our main mission, namely to produce better people for a better world. Thank you for those thoughts on behalf of all of us. Thank you.